I feel almost redundant after that, to be honest. I, I think that was a fairly um, coherent overview of the genre. So, rethinking the conversation, a geomythological deep map. Understanding a landscape is to decode its deep narrative topography. It is to acknowledge that every act of mapping is to enter into a dialogue with the inscribed voices of the past and to re-inscribe every mapped place for the future. But what happens if only some voices are inscribed? As we've seen recently in response to terrorism, when only some voices are heard, divisions of silence are created, people drop off the map. A segregation of listening results in assumed hierarchies that do not speak for all inhabitants, limiting understanding. They build walls instead of bridges in our mental maps, and walls often offer an often false sense of stability. When this status quo is questioned, the very ground upon which people stand consequently quakes, and their fear-filled thinking falls all too easily into binary mode, resulting in a polarised rhetoric that excludes more than it includes. Huddling beneath the umbrella of familiarity bias, the world as it is becomes blown open as a myth. It's a mythical map that we once clung to in order to make sense of our conceptual and physical landscapes. Often, whilst we stand obliviously blocking the very goal we are seeking. Format can distract attention away from the content and condition value without context. And so we end up making judgments based on limited perceptions as we attempt to enforce traditional roots of order upon a shifting tide. We enforce our map upon other people because it makes us feel like we know where we are. But if one takes a stance that is outside of the expected territory, then one unsettles those normative seas, rocking the boat within which fears have gathered together to create a closed world view. Sometimes this insularity is willfully done, but more often than not, it arises simply because people have never thought to look beyond the boundary behind which they are so comfortable, because they don't speak the language there. But if you want to get somebody's attention, you have to duck under your own and their comfort zone and unravel normativity from the inside, become conceptually multilingual. For circumscribed response to difference is more than just politics or refusal to talk. It's the insidious limitations grown by cultural implotment, most personified by an everyday map. It's a chronic intellectual insecurity and anxiety towards the unknown of other people's alien worlds. It's a disinclination to engage and tread in a world whose map is unfamiliar. Within academia, this is displayed all too frequently through a fear of other people's big words. One's own big words are perfectly fine, but in the foreign land of another department, they speak in strange tongues few more so than between science and the arts, but also within facets of disciplines themselves, such as between theoretically engaged and non-theoretically engaged practitioners, where language barriers can sometimes be wielded like shields in battle. So how, we, how may we translate across such self-imposed borders to rethink the conversation? Well, I'm attempting to answer this question utilising geomythology, which is predominantly the study of geoscience and myth. It straddles classics, literature, anthropology, archaeology, theory and field, geology, history, philology, philosophy, you name it, we probably do it, in order to find the natural phenomena which may be encoded within a story. This is not a new practice. But the term itself was only coined in 1966 by the geologist Dorothy Battagliano. But since the earliest recesses of classical antiquity, scholars have grappled with the notion that archaic cosmological narratives may map space and may be contained in eric, epic poems and accounts, such as Homer's Iliad and the Hesiod Theogony. 
from the da- paradox of paradox of Good grief, I can never say that. From the paradoxographer, there we go, Pelophytus, to the philosophy of Plato, Strabo's geography, and on to Pliny the Elder, it's natural history, pioneering explorations were undertaking to seek the relationship between tales of the land and the land itself, between hidden roots and the roots seen, between the intangible maps of mythology and the tangible maps of empiricism. These discussions were inherently multidisciplinary and continued to be so throughout antiquarianism in the West until the Victorian era. And at this juncture, the fashion for useful knowledge took over, separating the sisters of science and story into competing disciplines over which science claimed the crown. And for more information on that, I refer you to Melanie Keane's work, uh, Science in Wonderland, published this year. Despite the multi-genre essence of the research, emphasis has always been made upon examining what alleged facts may be encoded in the tracks of fiction. The truth chased has been incarcerated by communication consistently running in one direction. Science asks of myth a question, myth attempts to answer, science decides whether or not the answer was correct, then asks another question and so on and so forth. And the questions asked are always variations upon Dear myth, how much can we stretch your tangibility? Are you really real? (laughs) Reality is defined in this practice as being something that can be scientifically proven. It's not a philosophically engaged concept. (laughs) Myth-myth is then disregarded as being false and fanciful, a silly story. She receives a pat on the head sometimes for getting it right. And so science goes on his way in search of the next tale to patronise. It's rare for Miss Smith to be allowed to question back or challenge decisions made. She's not allowed to argue. She's dismissed as being naive and primitive because she's pre-scientific. Therefore, she surely cannot possess the appropriate skills to think critically. She does not have her offerings understood from within their own position as stories. Instead, they're examined out of context while she stands in the dock awaiting her judgment. The impact of this is that having met at a crossroads, the two coterie of science and mythology never quite engage in a constructive conversation and thus eventually continue in their merry ways along different directions, following different signposts, though often with the same destination in mind, that of engaging with land and seascapes authentically. Please note. Therefore, I wondered what would happen if we gave Miss Smith back her voice. What if the orthodox hierarchy were to be dismantled? And instead of being a diktat, an inquisition, the geomythological discussion became a demotic cartographical construct which all routes across the land could share. Instead of having a striation of isolated narrative paths arguing through our communities, we'd have a coalition, an interpretive polyphony, a deep map. I'd say for those not familiar with the concept, but you've just had the concept explained, and I'm going to repeat the same quote. A deep map is a conceptual stratification. It reframes and reflects an 18th century antiquarian approach to place, which includes a wide range of disciplines and perspectives. Basically everything he might ever want to say about a specific place. And the deep map is therefore more than just a two-way conversation. It's a heteroglossic debate. As an output, it honours all areas equally and can be explored as a multifaceted depiction of time and place, embedding evidence within its spatial temporal context from hitherto unexplored angles. It reframes perspective, and in so doing, it unsettles pre-existing authorities. In this manner, the deep map can be said to sympathise with Karen Barard's onto-ethical epistemology, that it represents phenomena revealed through the ontological inseparability of interacting agencies. The agencies in question are the various disciplinary voices who, in listening to each other, are able to converse harmoniously rather than in competition, creating a choir instead of a row. For in changing the apparatus, the map, we make the world differently. We expose the invisible. 
One example of how a change of mapping apparatus can alter the geographical perspective comes from Hagit Kisa, an anthropologist, artist and activist whom I was lucky enough to share a panel with at the University of Vienna last month. She's been working extensively with a public lab in Jerusalem, enabling both Israeli and Palestinian communities to make their own balloon or kite elevated cameras with which to take aerial photographs and map the urban environments in which they reside. As a citizen-led initiative, it explores the political and social implications of collaborative technologies in places of civil inequality and conflict, and has been developed through various partnerships between activists, architects, planners, community organisers, and different groups of inhabitants that are interested in DIY map making for their causes and needs. And it says that for her, the central impetus for producing independent and DIY aerial photography of this contested city is not fight to fight the dominant narrative represented in existing and conflicting maps. Rather, her interest is in tools that would enable us all to develop new ways of seeing in the city. By this, she means to liberate the way we act, move, navigate and identify relations between places and people away from the stronghold of authoritative ways of seeing. New ways of seeing, where the authority is even handed across areas of expertise and local knowledge, is the premise I've worked with within my own deep mapping projects. Where Haggit has taken aerial photography as her canvas, one of the routes I've taken has been to adapt the late Robert Asker's lead and utilise film for layering myth and map. So that instead of untangling a cumulative interdigitation of interpreted experience into neat little boxes in the lab, geomythology instead threads them even closer together into a woven palimpsest in which the successive episodes of deposition or layers of activity remain superimposed one upon the other without loss of evidence, but are so reworked and mixed together that it's difficult or impossible to separate them out into their original constituents. And I wondered, would this trigger a type of interactive causation where overlapping scales of reference interacted, resulting in the blurring of divisions, thus allowing for mutual transformation that can change the way we engage with one another? We can see in the various fields of geoscience through the, the different specialisms it employs, geology, microbiology, bathymetry, etc. And we see an equivalent within the arts when drama and music come together, or painting and installations. But what equivalent certificate of process could be revealed from within a myth through a deep map that engaged science and art, if all are represented without any attempt to tear them apart? The key, I decided, lay in engagement. Mike Shanks has coined the term pragmatology, which is the theory and practice of pragmata. Pragmata are things in ancient Greek. The verb at the root of pragmata is pratin, to act in the material world, engage with things. Things which include that which is active as well as passive, so deeds and doings, duties and obligations, encounters and responses. Pragmatology is just the creative process of engagement with things in the material world. And to regard old things of archaeological and heritage interest as pragmata reminds us of the primacy of engaging with things. That's how we relate to the past and to each other about the past, delineates how it exists, and there can be no end to the manner in which it is rewritten, reframed, redrawn. I therefore applied this theory to my current research into the flooding of Cardigan Bay in West Wales, where I've been examining the stories of the seascape that span at least the last thousand years and comparing it with the archaeological data that spans inundation from at least the last 10,000 years. This has led me to grapple with medieval Welsh literature, modern folk tales, and local epistemology, along with physically digging up the peats and sands of our shoreline and shivering in the lab and trawling through archives. Amongst the tales that have kept me company to the endless mud is that of Bendigade, Ran, and Branwen. Oh, hang on. Let's go back. Can I go back one? No, yeah, previous. There we go. From the Mabinogi. The Mabinogi is a group of four stories from within a larger collection of 11 medieval Welsh myths, believed to have originally been oral tales, 
The forms we know of today were written down by monks within the White Book of Hivok and the Red Book of Hergust, circa, circa 1350 and 1400 respectively. In the story, Branwen, daughter of Lear, sister of Bendigaivran, son of Lear, and king of the island of the mighty, is married off to the king of Ireland as part of a political alliance. The plan backfires from the offset, and eventually Branwen sends a message home for help via Starling. Bendigaivran summons an army and goes over to Ireland with the intention of sorting things out. It doesn't go quite as well as they'd hoped. So what we have is a clash of communication between the West and the East, a marital dispute, a sea crossing through flooded land, the tragedy of ensuing war. I analyse this text according to my own method, details of which I'm not going to go into now. I'm just going to refer you to my dissertation, which I'm afraid you'll then have to read. Having reached that work's natural conclusion, I since collated all the data and began to put it together into a series of performances and presentations, along with a deep map short film in collaboration with other experts. The film, which I will play for those of you who didn't see it on Monday, responds to geoarchaeological fieldwork in collusion with art, music and myth to represent one stretch of coastline across time, space and disciplines with the aim of not compromising integrity and to re-establish the very foundation upon which normative perspectives reside. We're each taking this film into our respective fields using it as a tool by which to trigger alternative responses to physical and human geography, diversifying skills and transferring knowledge en route. It's a post-representational method. And as such, this is just a starting phase. It's the first layer in a deep map landscape as method. And therefore, it's still very much a work in progress and may never actually be finished. But that doesn't matter. For deep maps do not explicitly seek authority or objectivity, but provoke negotiation between insiders and outsiders, experts and contributors over what is represented and how. They're inherently unstable, continually unfolding and changing in response to new data, new perceptions and new insights. Because the world as it is in which we live does not stand still in a cartographical concept. It doesn't pose for a paper-held portrait. It's forever in flux. It flows like a river beneath the bridge on which our thinking stands, a river in which we can never step twice. Therefore, instead of becoming lost in the flood, we have to either be carried passively like a boat or be active in our leadership, joining forces to be as a bridge, or as we say in Welsh, Avoben be bond. My film is three and a half minutes long. Would you like to see it? Yeah. Okay. Bendigaidvran sailed towards Ireland, and the sea was not wide then. Bendigaidvran waded across. There were only two rivers, called the Thli and the Archan. Later the sea spread out when it flooded the kingdom. were sinking, but not yet sinking. Trees still rose here and there through their muddy waters, giants defying the flood that doomed them. 
She whispered her plight to a starling, a quick-witted, bright little bird, and he's joined the great flock flying eastward. And Branwen's message was heard. Oh, my brother, dear Bendigade Ran, please come and rescue me. The Irish are keeping me prisoner. Oh, come, oh, come, set me free. Lord, they said, we have extraordinary news. We have seen a forest on the sea where we never before saw a single tree. Then the Gadran has mustered his army. A giant he waded the sea. By the sun I am crossing two rivers till they got to the shores of Liffey. It. You get the hint of it. So you've got the the science imagery combining with the traditional story, and then artists from the space and musicians from that landscape all working together. So then we've got um, the musician, who's a philologist, is taking that into one university and discussing it from a linguistic perspective. And then you've got the musician who's taking that and using it to build other music in response to the science. And then we're taking, I'm taking it then within archaeology to show different ways of exploring archaeological information. Uh, Dr. Bates is out there, he's taking it into geoscience. I think he's the bravest to explain um, how we can use geoscience and art as, a, as an educational tool and so on. So it becomes a map that goes across disciplines by unifying all the different voices when it plays. Anyway. Thank you.